Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Story Survive program with Nate Leipziger. Nate has spent many years speaking about his experiences during the Holocaust, but this is his first time speaking at the museum. I'll interview Nate for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for audience Q&A. So feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box throughout the program, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so now I'd like to welcome Nate, and uh, thank you so much, all of you, to, for being here with us today. Um, so Nate, if you want to turn your camera back on. Hi, Nate. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, so, so, Nate, you were born in Poland in 1928. Correct. Um, can you tell me um, about where you grew up and what you remember about your childhood and, and life before the war? The place where I grew up in Poland is on the west southwest part of Poland. And it's a very industrial part of the, uh, of the country. It's where they're all the coal mines and smelters are. And so it's a very dirty city. And uh, uh, you couldn't go out for the day without uh, coming back and having to change your shirt because it was black from the suit that, that was flowing in the air. So because of that, my parents used to take us to the farm every summer to get some fresh air because we had to, uh, you know, with our respiratory uh, problems were very prevalent in that uh, city. So we used to go down to the Carpatan Mountains and have a wonderful life together. My family consisted of uh, myself, my sister, who was three years older, my mother and father. My father had a very large family. He had, there was eight, eight siblings in his uh, uh, generation and uh, uh, about uh, most of the siblings lived in our on our town. My mother's family was much smaller. Uh, her two, she had two sisters that did not have any uh, offsprings. And um, uh, we were a modern family. We were belonged to a, a synagogue, which uh, the people who were really religious would not go to the synagogue. They would go to a shtibo, which is a small prayer room. And, but uh, most people came to synagogue in top head and uh, clear shaven or our, our uh, rabbi, I think, I don't remember, but I think he spoke mainly in Yiddish or, or in Polish, but I think mostly, mostly he spoke in Yiddish. That was our um, uh, language that uh, we were communicating. Also my language, my first language was German and the uh, second was, uh, uh, Silesian, and then the third was uh, uh, Polish, and the fourth was Yiddish. So uh, we had, uh, we were very, very, not very rich family. We were actually uh, on the lower middle class uh, family, and uh, we lived in very relatively uh, small apartment, but we had a wonderful family life, and I never knew that we were poor. Um, so what was your relationship like sort of with your parents and, and your sister, um, your immediate family? Well, that, that depended on the time of day and uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, my mother was uh, my protector, my idol. I loved her very much. Uh, I uh, like to watch her work with her hands. My father was very strict and my sister, uh, was uh, the apple of my parents' uh, eye because uh, she was very, she was a brilliant girl. And, uh, you know, uh, that was uh, the relationship. So with my father, when I did something wrong, he took the, he took the whip to me and uh, I used to run to my mother to uh, save me. This is a picture of my engagement of my parents in 1922. Yeah, and then, and this is your mother later. That's my right? mother, and this is one of the last photographs taken in 1938 mm -hmm. in the town where we lived, Hojuv, mm -hmm. and uh, it was dedicated to a woman who worked with my uh, grandparents all, all her life. She was, uh, she was there for 
uh, all the time that I knew. And uh, even after the war, she stayed with my aunt and uh, she actually died in my aunt's house. Wow. And then, um, and this is more of your sort of extended yes, family so with your is, parents. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, my father is in the middle standing and his uh, brother and sister to his right mm -hmm. and uh, uh, his uh, sister to his left and uh, her husband, both, both the other guys are, two, are the husbands of, their, of his two sisters. So he had, the eight, there were seven of them. This is, there were seven of them and uh, the, last, the eighth one lived in Canada. Okay. And then, and this is your sister? Yes, this is significant because uh, you notice that she is wearing the star of David, mm -hmm. or the yellow star, and uh, as required. And she's sending this picture to a Christian girl Mm -hmm. who kept this picture all through the war after, this is 1942. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time already it was very prohibitive for Jews to have any intercourse with uh, uh, Polish people, any social intercourse. And, mm -hmm. uh, but she, they communicated and uh, my, uh, the, uh, her girlfriend kept the picture all through the war in Germany and, camp, and labor, slave labor camps. And she gave it to me in 1945 when I went back to Poland to look for who survived. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so when it was clear that the Nazis were going to invade Poland, uh, your family moved further inwards into Poland to Lodz. Um, so why why was that decision made to move there, and and what what happened after that move? We were expelled from our hometown because they started to make many cities Judenrein, free of Jews, and they concentrated Jews in our area, with Sosnowiec, and actually in some surrounding area. That was the area where where uh, uh, Sosnowiec was and Auschwitz were actually annexed to the Reich, but they kept uh, the, the Jews in, in the area, not in closed ghettos, uh, including Krakow, which uh, was uh, also a, an open ghetto at first. And um, uh, so we were moved, we were, had to move to uh, uh, Sosnowiec, which was, uh, and we had to move into the Jewish district of Sosnowiec. And um, that's it. And uh, it was actually a change for me because in Hozhov, I was a minority in our apartment. I was the only Jew in the apartment. But when I moved to Sosnovets, all the people in my apartment were Jewish. Mm -hmm. So that was a change, the character of my friends and my relationship to, to the Jewish uh, kids. Right. Um, and so, in the ghetto, you became an electrician's apprentice, um, and you well, were also in, in 1939. The, the mm -hmm. Nazis closed all the Jewish schools, and so I was in grade 11. I mean, in grade I was age 11, grade four. I just finished mm -hmm. grade four, so that's all the schooling I had, and uh, I was uh, running on the street together with all the other kids that didn't go to school. And the Jewish community created a, a, a trade schools, which the Nazis allowed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my mother enrolled, made me two years older and enrolled me uh, at the age of 12. He had to be 14, but anyways, I went to the school, I became electrician and I got a job right after working in a shoe factory, which was uh, a very good uh, situation for us while we were in the Sosnovets ghettos. Mm -hmm. And I say ghettos because we were moved from Sosnovets, an open ghetto, Right. to uh, still uh, 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 an open ghetto, which did not have any walls or barbed wire, but it was on a hillside and a uh, hilltop and it was surrounded by fields. So anybody who left the ghetto was very, very noticeable. Mm -hmm. And be, but before you moved to the second ghetto, before you were moved to, the, to Shredula, um, your father was sent to do forced labor, right? Yes, he was sent to in, uh, forced labor in uh, 1940 already. Mm -hmm. in 19, well, 1939, he was expelled and went to Soviet Union. And mm -hmm. then he came back in 1940 
And right after he came back, he was sent to a labor camp, labor, forced labor camp in Germany. And then he was there for four months, he came back and uh, the situation was good. So he volunteered to go the second time, but this time it was already a concentration camp from which he actually escaped. And, and how, how did that escape happen? Do you, did he ever talk to you about that? Well, I knew, I know exactly how it happened. He made himself sick. And since the camp did not have any medical facilities, they had to bring them into Sosnovets and Sosnovets, uh, he uh, jumped out of a second story window and mm -hmm. uh, went into hiding. Okay. So, so then he, so he comes back to the ghetto and then in 1942, your family was relocated to Shrodula. Um, so what, what were kind of the differences between these two ghettos and, and what was the experience like for you uh, kind of moving between the two? Well, moving to the second ghetto was actually, uh, actually an advantage mm -hmm. because uh, we had a house, uh, one half a room. We were mm -hmm. so, so crowded in the ghetto that each family of four or more people had half a room. So we had a half a room and uh, which consisted of uh, two beds and a table between them. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And, a, and a, uh, like a dry sink. Uh, credence and uh, but I had there was a garden and I went ahead and proceeded to uh, plant some uh, vegetables since seeing as I was going to the city and like working in a factory and work going to the city every day I could obtain seeds and I seeded various different things lettuce uh, carrots uh, tomatoes and uh, all other things uh, cabbage and, uh, you know, it was growing and uh, we got there early, early April. And by, by the time we were, ex we, were, we were deported, which was in August the 2nd, there was a crop there. We, I had just partly um, took some radishes off and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the, there was a big problem because I had to uh, make sure that I got there before my neighbors did. Um, were you still working as an electrician at this point, or I was working? Well, actually, I was. I started as an electrician, but then I changed my the the, the job was finished. So I convinced the owners to uh, make me uh, part of the warehouse. So I was the warehouse keeper, giving out material to the shoemakers and uh, cutting leather, both uh, shoe leathers and top leathers, and. Uh, learning a lot. So, uh, you know, I had difficulties as a child. I had difficulties uh, learning. And my, as opposed to my sister who was brilliant, my parents always used to say, well, Nate's not gonna uh, be a scholar. He's gonna be a tailor or a shoemaker. And of course uh, their prediction came true. And <laughs> at the age of 15, I became a shoemaker. Was your sister working at this time as well? No, my sister did not work. She worked uh, at home with my mother. They were knitters. So mm -hmm. they would uh, take apart, take apart uh, knitted clothes and uh, re-knit them into other things. And they did that for, in order to have an income. Okay. So after you're sent to Shradula, you were then deported and sent to Auschwitz. Um, and at that time, uh, you were sent to selection. So can you talk about what happened during the selection process? Okay, I, I'll tell you about the, the deportation, which was the most traumatic uh, experience that I ever had. So we, we were in the ghetto, which was, you know, we were free to go and we could stay at home or go, you know, go to work. And uh, on the weekend when we were not, uh, on Sunday when we did not work, we could go all over the ghetto. We could meet um, our friends, have uh, you know snacks together, or play cards, or whatever, football and or soccer. But uh, then suddenly, on August the first, Saturday night, August the first to Sunday, August the second, the uh, Nazis invaded our ghetto, and they proceeded to go from house to house, pulling people out. Uh, my friends and I, we created two hiding places, which we hid. 
And uh, the first selection, the first uh, deportation, we uh, survived in our hiding place. But in the afternoon, they came back. And this time, they were much more uh, equipped with uh, ladders and uh, picks, pick and axes. And um, breaking down walls to find to find the people who obviously were hiding, and so they they found us. And in the meantime, in the first hiding place that we went, uh, a, a young woman came with a with a baby that must have been days old, and she wanted to be admitted. And unfortunately, uh, the a man did admit her. But uh, when we came out after the first search, uh, her child was dead. And that was a terrible situation because uh, to me, it didn't occur to me at that time because you know, uh, at that time we justified that the death of a child saved uh, maybe 35 people for possibly another few weeks or maybe forever or, but at any rate, later on, it became obvious that uh, a child that we became murderers that not only did the Nazis murder us, but we became murderers in order to survive another few hours, another few days. And then they took us uh, to the railroad station where we had to spend the night. And of course, you can imagine there are thousands of people and women and some children still, and the children are crying, mommy, I want to go home. I'm hungry, I'm tired, I want to sleep, I want my bed. And what did the mother, what could the mother do? other than comfort them just to hold them to their bosom and just give them love because that's all we had. There was no food, no water. And the only thing that the mothers could give their children is their last minute of love. And of course, in the morning, the train came, uh, they, they pulled up a train, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, cars with uh, um, cattle cars, and then we were, we were shoved into the cattle cars. And of course, there was a bedlam because the family tried to stay together. We felt that we were told that we we're being resettled. And as long as we were being resettled, we wanted to stay together. We didn't think that we would be uh, you know, separated. But so as long as we could, we wanted to stay together. So people were pushing and shoving in order to be together. It's a, it's a terrible scene, which you see today on the movies of the of the people going into the train, you, you wonder, well, why are they fighting to get into the train? That's why they were fighting, to maintain their contact with the family. And so we were in the train and we were in the middle of the train. I think there was about 80 or 90 people in that car and we would just have room to, to sort of stand. And uh, the four of us sort of huddled together. And uh, my mother said, whoever survives, will meet at her mother's uh, neighbor. Her mother by that time was uh, 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 demise. She uh, died of natural causes uh, as, as did her father. So it was only uh, the four of us. And um, uh, we were in the car for a few hours, uh, much uh, not unlike the many people who came from Hungary and other places which were there for hours and hours on days, but uh, we were just there for a few hours. They came, the train arrived somewhere in the middle of nowhere and we were told to disembark and uh, there shouts, everybody, everybody out, everybody out. And I stayed with my mother and my sister because I didn't want to leave them. And my father came over to me and says, you come with me. They separated men and women into two columns. And he says, you come with me. At that time I was 15 years old. And of course, my father was selected to uh, go to work and my mother and my sister were selected. But I being uh, 15 years old, looking like 12, was selected to, uh, to stay wherever it meant to that this place was. So I was trying to uh, assess as to what the situation was. And uh, I reasoned that my sister and my mother would go to Germany to a labor camp, my father, Likewise, and that I would just stay wherever I was. And uh, this was most likely the place where they said we're going to be resettled. And I had no, no inkling of what's going to happen to me. Neither was I worried because I felt I was self-sufficient and I could 
look after myself. I worked there for three years in the shoe factory. So of course, certainly I'm not gonna get lost. And then my, so I heard my father call my name. And uh, there he was standing with a Nazi officer. And he says, this is my son. He's 17 years old. And uh, he's, uh, who's that phone? Okay, uh, he's 17 years old. And uh, I want him to be with me. And the, the Nazi looked at me and he says, he is hardly, it looks like 17. I mean, my father told him that, you know, uh, uh, lack of food was uh, prevented me from growing up. At any rate, uh, after an interrogation, I satisfied him by speaking perfect German and uh, uh, telling him, answering his question, he says, okay, you take it. Now we were marched off and we went into a big barrack where we were uh, just men. They told us to give off all our possession, rings, uh, uh, money, whatever we had on us. And uh, we were tattooed, which was the number on my arm. 133628. 28. And uh, we were, uh, our hair was uh, shaved all over the body. We were disinfected. And then we were given a lecture. We got the lecture consisted, it was given to by us by a couple, by a prisoner who was uh, in charge of the prisoners. And he said, This is uh, not a sanatorium, this is a concentration camp. And uh, if you do as you are told and you don't do any infractions, then your lifespan is four months. The only way to get out of here is to go through a factory in Germany or you go out through the gas chamber in the chimney. So that was a very severe lesson, which uh, I had trouble to understand. Mm -hmm. And it took me years and even today I don't know how I survived uh, that information that they were telling us that our families, our cousins and uncles and aunts were being gassed to death for mm -hmm. no reason whatsoever. So this is the transition which I'm talking about, being in the ghetto, being a free human being, mm -hmm. being a number in a prison, in a, in a concentration camp. And it was, Terrible, terrible, terrible transition. That was the most difficult moment of my of my existence up to that point. Was that the first time you knew what was happening at Auschwitz and, and yes. other camps like it? That was, I had no inkling whatsoever. My parents may have, but they certainly, if they did, they did not share it with me. Mm -hmm. So after you were in Auschwitz, you were then transferred to Fünfteichen, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, that's correct. Um, so how long were you at Auschwitz before you were transferred? And, and what was the difference between the two camps? We were there four months. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 in the full extent of, uh, of uh, our lifespan. And in November, we went to uh, Fünfteichen through the intervention of my father again, who uh, convinced the Nazi officer at the risk of his own life that he should uh, let me go with him. So uh, I was uh, 601 men, 601st person on a 600 men transport, which they took uh, 49 more, so 650. But the official record shows that only 600 people left. So as far as the records show, I did not survive till I got to the next camp uh, two years later when I ended up in Rose Gross Rosen and I got a new number. And there the, the documentation is again, that I'm alive and I'm with my father. And uh, we were in the fifth fashion, we were, to, was a croup factory. Uh, and I worked as an electrician, which was a very good job because I worked inside. I worked with tools and I didn't have to use pick and shuff, shovel. And uh, it was much easier to survive and my father became a machinist. They became a very, very uh, skilled uh, machinist. So we had a relatively easy way to survive for the next 16 months till January. And this is still January, almost 
the same day as the uh, liberation of Auschwitz, uh, January, they, they liberated January 27th, January 19th, we were forced on a death march from Fifth Eichen to Grossrosen, where we lost, uh, to, there was 180 kilometers, and we had to do that in four days, and we lost a third of the prisoners. At that time, we were already about 50% Jews and 50% non-Jews. 50%, most of the non-Jews were Catholic or Polish uh, prisoner of uh, for <coughs> different infractions uh, for uh, sabotage or uh, underground work. So, so sort of in succession, you're, you're sent to Gross, Rosen, Flossenburg, and Leonberg. And you spent two weeks each at Gross Rosen and, and Flossenburg before then being transferred again. So what what was this period really like for you and, and how did it feel to sort of be going from, from place well, to place? Well, every time we went on a train, it was without food. Well, maybe we, we were given some food when we started, but no food while we were on the train. If they gave us food for two days, we were usually on the train for four or five days, up to a week. and. Um, uh, no water, so but it was uh, we were in open cars, open uh, railroad cars, so we could uh, eat the snow that was falling on us for water. But uh, every time that they transported us, it was very very uncertain situation whether we would survive the next transport. And uh, we were transported from Grossrosen to Flossenburg. The Flossenburg was a terrible camp, was a Steinbruch as a quarry. And people were dying the left, right, and center. It was a very brutal camp. And we were very happy to, uh, we registered to go to work in a factory because they asked for people who were skilled in factory work. So we, we uh, uh, lined up, but uh, it was a question whether they would let me go because of the fact that I was still um, looked like a 12 or 15 year old boy rather than a 16, 17 year old boy. And uh, we had, finally we arrived in Leonberg. I mean, in uh, yeah, in Leonberg, and there, there we were exposed to typhus fever, which they were sent us to another camp. And it was a question whether they going to whether we're going to survive their next trip because they usually uh, disposed of people who had uh, been infected by typhus fever. But we went to send to Dachau, and uh, from Dachau we went to we did not go into the Dachau camp, but we went to a sub camp to Mildorf, and then from Mildorf, we went to a forest camp. And there, I, by that time, I must have had exposure to typhus fever because I was totally emaciated. I had no flesh on my body, and I was what they call Muslim. And, and I was ready to give up. And uh, I was, uh, I already talked to my father. I told him, you go ahead. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going. I'm giving up. And I said, whatever's going to happen here in camp, I'm going to I'm going to take my chance. I can't go because I've just been shot before we get to the next uh, railroad car. And uh, my father uh, wouldn't hear about it. And uh, he so we lined up uh, pretty, pretty well, the last people to leave the camp. And there was the commandant standing at the gate and I broke the line and I went over to the commandant and I said, sir, I, I can't go. I will not make uh, the next uh, destination. I don't want to be shot on the way. I, I'd rather stay here. So he took a one look at me and he saw that I was to totally, uh, totally spent. And I said, but my father, I want him to stay with me. And he said, no, he has to go. And so, you know, we argued with him for a few seconds and he pulled up, he, my father put uh, his arm underneath, uh, his hand under my arm and we started walking away. When he called out after us and with a smirk, he said, we can both stay. And we didn't know what that smirk meant, but uh, maybe we didn't care at that point because uh, we knew that we could not make the next destination. So uh, we stayed in the camp and uh, Three days later, or four days later, uh, the Americans came and liberated us. So this was in 
April of 1945. May, right? May the 2nd, May, May the okay. 2nd, 1945. And uh, as I say, this was an empty, an empty victory. We were uh, totally alone with mm -hmm. just the two of us, which were more than 99% of the people who were there just by themselves, not, not a brother or a father. And we were unusual, the fact that we were together. And, but we had nowhere to go. We have all possessions were gone. All our uh, family was gone. And now we had, you know, the terrible time to decide as to what we're going to do, how we're going to reconstruct our lives. And the only thing that we had without, on us was our life. So our desire at that point to live was even stronger than it was in the camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, uh, two days after the war ended on May the 8th and May the 10th, I became deathly ill with typhus fever and I almost expired from typhus fever. And I remember lying on the bed. Most of the time I was up in a coma and I was arguing with my God. I said, why are you gonna take me now? Why, uh, why now nobody is trying to kill me anymore? Why am I, why am I going to die now? Mm -hmm. And he responded. Yeah. <laughs> and I, two days later, four days later, after my favorite fever broke, and uh, I was on my way to recovery, which was very, very slow mm -hmm. because I was a uh, skeleton and I had all kinds of uh, other diseases, skin diseases, stomach problems. And uh, well, the recovery was very, very slow. So uh, I actually have a picture of you soon after liberation, about six weeks afterwards. Right. Um, As oh, you can see, I hardly look like a 17-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I'm 17 years old. Wow. So uh, maybe being... Uh, looking young all my life, maybe that's uh, what saved my me. So that today I'm at uh, 94, almost 94, 93 and three quarters. I am still going strong. So yeah, this was, uh, this was the way, there was the first grow of my hair, as you can see, because our hair was uh, shaved. And you can see how my ears stick out. And it was the first pair of glasses that I had because the glasses that I wore in camp only had one lens. Oh, wow. And for, for almost two years, I walked around with only one end. And of course, uh, one of my eyes became uh, dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually, you decided to go back to Poland to try to find members of your family, if I understand correctly. Yes. After, um, after I recovered, I was in the hospital for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I uh, decided we're going to go and look for who has survived. Mm -hmm. And just remember, my mother said we should meet at her mother's neighbor. So that was my um, our, uh, my greatest desire is to go and to see who who has survived and who I will find. And that was a uh, I went by myself because at that time my father was military age and the Soviet. Union was still in war with Japan and they were taking men from, that came from Germany from the camps and they sent them straight to the front. Mm -hmm. So I was advised to go by myself. And so I went to Poland by myself. My father stayed in Germany and um, I went to Poland and uh, I found three cousins and uh, my, my, my aunt's husband. And uh, I found two of my mother's sisters sisters who were saved by uh, Gentile people, the righteous among the nations, who saved them on the difficult condition and they survived. And they were there in Poland. One was in Katowice, one was in Lodz. Wow. And I went to visit them and I got the pictures that, a uh, picture of 1938 of my mother, I got from them. Mm -hmm. And um, because they, 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 the woman that was uh, with my grandmother all, the, all her life, lived now with my aunt and she had that picture. So it was all circumstance that uh, we have been able to piece things together about our former life. It was not easy as everything was gone. And um, 
then I had a difficult time, but I did return to Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, while I was in Poland, I found that my mother and my sister were executed in the gas chamber number four or five in Birkenau in, 19, in October the 6th, 1930, 1943, while we were still in Auschwitz, we were still in, uh, in Birkenau, and I saw the, the women being transported naked from the women's camp to the crematoria, not thinking that my mother and my sister were among them. I wish I never saw that, that scene. It was a terrible scene because the women were screaming and crying because they knew what was awaiting them. They knew that they're going to their death. There was no more uh, charades. There's no more uh, hiding to what was really happening because once you were in Auschwitz, everybody knew, or Birkenau, everybody knew what was happening with the gassing and the, and the burning. Yeah, that's, yeah, um, so, yeah, that's terrible. Uh, and so you, you're you still living in, in Germany at this yes, point? Yes, I returned to Germany. And now the thing was that uh, Germany, uh, Poland was under the uh, occupation of the Soviet Union. There was no way we were going to go there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was no, we were not going to stay in Germany. My father had his oldest brother still living in Canada. So we applied, we sent him a, a secret message and uh, he responded to getting us papers, but the Canadian government wouldn't let us in until 1948. We mm -hmm. stayed in Germany for three long years. That's, uh, you know, it's a, a, a 17-year-old boy's life, seven, three years is very, very uh, long. Yeah. And uh, I was uh, fortunate that I had uh, that I have met some German university students who I uh, hired to teach me some algebra and uh, German. So I spoke perfectly. I did not know how to read or write. So mm -hmm. they, or grammar. So they, they, they taught me about that. And uh, then in 19, we were refused twice to go to Canada. On the third time we were admitted in 48, we arrived. And then there we, there we were. Now the question was, what am I gonna do with my life? Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked my cousin whether what my chances are to go into high school. So he says, well, let's go and find out. He took me to Harvard Collegiate in uh, one of the very prominent uh, and uh, prestigious high school in Toronto, yeah. mainly Jewish people. And uh, I went to the principal and the principal called the uh, head of the uh, mathematics. And he said, this guy claims he knows algebra. So he gave me a, an equation to solve and I solved it. And he says, okay, he's got, he's got algebra. So I got grade 13 algebra, uh, grade 11 algebra. Mm -hmm. And I had grade 11 subject, grade 12 subject and grade 13 German. And uh, that's how I started school. And uh, I was 20 years old. I reverted, I made myself two years younger again. Mm -hmm. And so this time I was uh, uh, on my papers. I was 18 years old. I was admitted to school. I made, to my greatest surprise, I worked day and night, but I made uh, grade 11, 12, and 13 in two years. Wow. And I was admitted uh, to university and to, I wanted to go into dentistry, which they refused me. And so I went into honor science, which was one of the most difficult courses at university, only mm -hmm. second to engineering science. And uh, uh, I survived uh, honor science and I mm -hmm. came through with uh, good marks. I stood seventh in the class of uh, 80, uh, of, only, of which only 20 made it. Mm -hmm. Out of 80 students, only 20, 20, 20 made the grade. Uh, all yeah. the other ones were failed. It was a very, it was a very very difficult course with very difficult uh, botany, zoology, chemistry, and physics and mathematics. It was brutal, and uh, mm -hmm. I survived it. And uh, then I decided I'm not going to go for dentistry. I wanted to go to engineering. So I went to Ryerson, and I told the man to the principal that I wanted to become. Uh, a student at Ryerson, which was just a collegiate 
which are only required grade 12. I mean, I had grade 13 and one year university. He says he would advise me not to uh, go to there, but to continue to go to engineering. So I switched, I went into engineering and I graduated in 1955, uh -huh. 54, one year before my graduation, I met my wife uh, and I wouldn't let her go. So I married her right away. <laughs> And uh, I was six years older, so I knew I knew uh, if I had a good uh, good thing going. So I married her. She was uh, nineteen. Wow. And uh, uh, we then had three beautiful daughters and uh, wonderful grand uh, son-in-laws and nine great grand uh, grandchildren. And then uh, you know seven of them are now married. Wow. Or with their partners, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we're 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 fantastically well off uh, in the fact that we have a big family. Mm -hmm. I have uh, uh, nine grandchildren and five great grandchildren, with one on the way. Unfortunately, three years ago, my middle daughter succumbed to cancer, ovarian cancer, and we lost her. And that was the greatest blow in my adult life to uh, what could happen to a parent to lose a child. Yeah. My wife and I, we uh, uh, fought through it together and uh, we had to overcome it. Uh, it's uh, not something that is easy to overcome, but uh, life must go on. And so we felt that uh, life was uh, sacred and that uh, we have to go on and um, uh, here yeah. we are. Well, I'm so sorry for your loss, but thank, thank you for sharing all that. It's really amazing to hear about your life in Canada after the war and you know all the things you accomplished are really amazing. And I, I do wonder how, how had your relationship with your father changed? When you arrived, well, you know, you it was difficult. Yeah. I always used to think that uh, he didn't care for me because uh, whenever I tried something, I, I usually did not come up to the, to his mark of acceptance, and I always always failed, and I always saw the disappointment in his eye, and I was uh, severely punished for uh, any infraction that I did, and I deserved being punished, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, so I felt that uh, he didn't love me, but. Uh, when we were in camp together, I was became, uh, you know, he he would he risk his life on many many occasions to save my life. And uh, after the war, we became like brothers rather than uh, father and son. Mm -hmm. We had a wonderful relationship till he died in 1972, at the wow. age of 70. Wow. Um. So. I, I really want to ask you about this before we move into audience Q&A. Um, in 2016, you accompanied Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to Poland. Um, and we actually have some really amazing pictures that you sent me at this time. Um, so can you talk about how this trip kind of came about and, and what this experience was like for you? Um, yes. Yeah. Since the, since the year... Uh... Uh, 20, uh, 1998, I was going on the March of the Living. Mm -hmm. This is 2016. So I was on the march about 18 times and uh, the leader of the March of the Living, Canadian leader, asked me to go with the Prime Minister, Ali Rubenstein, asked me to go on the march with uh, the Prime Minister, asked me whether I would go. I said, certainly, I would certainly go, but I, I had uh, three conditions and the conditions were actually four conditions. The first condition was that I have to go on business class because I have to sleep. And the mm -hmm. second condition was that I had to go with my wife. The third was that I had to bring one, one of my daughters. And the fourth that I had to bring of my granddaughters. So mm -hmm. there we were, there were the three generations of us accompanying the uh, prime minister who uh, vacated a minister from the first class seat and gave us the first class seats to my wife and I, so we should be traveling in comfort. And then when we got to Auschwitz, it was unbelievable because he was very responsive and was visibly moved with what we went through Auschwitz first. Auschwitz won first, the, 
the hair and the suitcase and the shoes and the utensils and he saw all of that. And uh, you know, I explained to him what happened. And then we walked into, into Birkenau and went through the gate, you know, and there you could see immediately what, what this place was. And I took him, we walked together this one kilometer from the gate to the monument. And uh, there in, the, in front of gas chamber number uh, three, we stood and we said, uh, the, the person that's in front of you who's on the on your right mm -hmm. is uh, Rabbi uh, Schneer Shear, and he's from Montreal. And uh, behind is the director of Auschwitz Museum, uh, Professor Chabinsky. Ch Ch but so he was. We were standing there. We and the rabbi was intoning El Mor Rachamin in Kaddish, and we were saying. And, and I was standing there, and I was obviously visibly moved and crying. And I looked over to see my the president to see the prime minister, and he, tears were flowing from his eyes. Mm -hmm. He was moved together with me. So there was the situation where he came. You know, only only seventy years earlier, I was standing in front of the gas chamber as a seventeen-year-old boy or fifteen-year-old boy, yeah. with no 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 future, with no hope. And here I came back with my family. And, uh, you know, many times I uh, came back with the March of the Living with thousands of students. And even so, they gave us a one way ticket to Auschwitz. We came back with Jewish, uh, with Jewish uh, kids wearing uh, uh, blue jackets with the uh, Star of David on it and flying the Israeli flags and singing songs. And, uh, you know, this was our victory. And here I was, you know, 70, at, at my age of uh, almost, uh, 88. And I was uh, standing there in front of the gas chamber with the prime minister of my country that um, gave me a new life. And uh, I've been able to raise a family. This was the pinnacle of my of my achievement in, in life to be able to do that and to speak to him and to bless him for the fact that he allowed me to come with him. That's amazing. Um, uh, yeah, like there's no words. That's just truly amazing. Um, so we have a lot of questions from uh, the audience. So um, someone asked, how so early in the war how did your parents sort of explain to you what was happening when you were moving into the ghetto and um they yeah didn't. how how did they explain that to you we didn't ask questions you must remember in mm -hmm. europe children did not ask questions and uh parents were not uh, obliged to answer the children's questions so i didn't ask and they did not share with me anything the only thing that I knew about the war and the progress of war is when I listened to the senior, to the older people reading German newspapers and seeing the pictures of the German newspaper showing how they were conquering Belgium and France and uh, the Netherlands and uh, the Blitzkrieg. And I was, uh, you know, I, I knew all of that, but I had no inkling as to what's going to happen to us. I mean, I knew that they threw out all the Polish Jews from Germany because they were in our hometown. And uh, I was uh, running for them as an errand boy and uh, earning money as F and tips. But uh, we did not ask questions. You just found out by osmosis, just by, by listening, keeping your eyes and ears open to what was happening around you. And can you talk about sort of what a typical day, I guess, would have been like in Auschwitz. Uh, we also have a question about that. Well, Auschwitz, we were in a Durchgangslager, which means transition camp, which was a, uh, a store like a warehouse for uh, um, merchandise that was going to be processed. Either you get shipped to Germany or you're going to be gassed. And we were there for, you know, many weeks, uh, six, four, 12 weeks before we got on the transport. And uh, each week we had to, I had to hide because uh, there was selection, weekly selections. So I had to hide, but 
uh, other than during the selections, I, you know, I could, I had the run of the, of the entire camp. I could go from barrack to barrack and talk to other people and see if there was, there was one other kid that was my age and uh, that we played together. And, um, uh, you know, the, we, we had uh, little food, but uh, I was treated well by the couple, uh, the student altista, the, the person that was in charge of our block. And uh, I had, uh, I did not lack food uh, in Auschwitz and uh, I did not have to go to work because uh, there was nobody's working. Uh, some people were uh, worked uh, taking uh, bricks from one pile to put it in another and then taking them back. But other than that, uh, some people went to work and uh, one day my father volunteered to go to, to work and he did. And he uh, left early in the morning and didn't come back till night. And the, the sky was already black and the chimney was spewing out the flames of the crematoria. And I was uh, thinking that, gee, my father made a, we made a mistake that uh, he went to work. The reason why he went to work because he wanted to let my mother know that I am with him because you see, you needed, you needed hope, you needed, something uh, will to live, you know, and so he, he felt that if she knew that I'm still alive, that would give her an added incentive to stay alive. But he didn't meet her up with her. He came back and, uh, you know, I asked him, where were you? So anyways, after work, he was taken to Canada, which was the camp where there was the showers. And uh, uh, he met there a tailor uh, foreman who offered him a job, that, which I didn't tell me, he didn't tell me that for until many years later, but uh, at the time he brought me some clothes that fit me. And I, when I put them on, I looked like a human being again, which helped me to leave the camp uh, when, when we did, when he uh, saved me the second time. And uh, he, then I, I found out that he was offered to uh, a job in Canada, which was pretty well, uh, um, it's guarantee of survival. And uh, he refused it because he said he wants to be with me and because without, without him being with me, I had no chance to survive. And he was right. And so he, uh, he came back and then weeks later, he, he saved me to go to Germany. And when you, uh, we have some people who are wondering when you were in Germany, what what were your interactions like with um, with the people <coughs> there, especially post war, or immediately after the war? So here you find yourself among your murderers, and you look at every face and you try to picture if he was in a uniform, whether he was one of the people that were shoving people into the gas chamber or he was one of the SS people. And, you know, I was, uh, he was constantly uneasy uh, when I met German people. I met German people of my old age, which was, uh, the, no, there were no Jewish kids of my age there in, in Bamberg. There was only uh, two other uh, kids of my age. And that means uh, being uh, 17 years old. And so I befriended some Germans of my age, which uh, I'm sure they were not involved in any Nazi uh, activity, but I didn't, I wasn't sure about their parents. And, uh, you know, we were, there was a very difficult time because I spoke to many, the university, especially the university students that, that tutored me. And I was trying to convince them that Nazi committed a crime. And they told us, well, the, the, the Nazis were not the only ones that hated the Jews. And he, they pointed out that Ford, uh, Ford Company, the, the leader, the, uh, Henry Ford was an anti-Semite and he had letters uh, written to Hitler. And he also agreed with Hitler that we should be uh, exterminated. And uh, he said, you know, and then he said, well, the Nazis, the, the Americans weren't so, uh, so nice to us. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, they bombed Dresden. I said, well, yeah, but uh, you bombed uh, all the cities uh, into, into, into oblivion. So they only retaliated. I said, what about the Soviets? They uh, invaded Germany and they raped women and they destroyed the, 
uh, houses and factories. And uh, I said, well, you know, you didn't take any prisoners of the, of the Russian soldiers. They were very kind to you. They could have been much worse. And, but I could not convince that they did anything wrong. So we also have another question who, uh, somebody is wondering when you first started to tell your story after the war and um, what that was sort of like to, to make that decision to talk about it. Well, till 1972, uh, at that time, I was already uh, 34 years old. I did not speak about my experiences. Uh, my father was the spokesman for the two of us. And when he spoke, when I was present, when he spoke, I just listened. And a lot of the information that I have since, uh, you know, I added to my own memory came from the memory of my father. And um, in 1972, when he died, I suddenly became the bearer, the carrier of the memory. And it became very important to me to continue to tell the story. By that time, I was a member of a synagogue. I was actually a president of a synagogue. And I talked to the confirmation class and we only talked to the 16, 17 year old students because we felt the subject was too brutal to part to, to, uh, to uh, share with younger students. And uh, we, together with another friend of mine, uh, Ellie Gotts, we went to different classes and we went to the conversion classes and we spoke about our experience. And that's how I started. And then I became chairman of the Toronto Jewish uh, Holocaust uh, Remembrance uh, Committee in uh, 1980 or 70, 70, 75, I think, 78, something like that. And then uh, I, I was instrumental in uh, organizing the uh, Ottawa Holocaust gathering that was uh, modeled after the Holocaust survivors gathering in, in Washington two years prior. And so in 1985, I uh, organized it together with uh, two other guys. I organized the March, the um, gathering, and we had 3,500 people registered. And it was a huge success. And then I became, I was asked to join the uh, Canadian Jewish Congress, which is the national body. I became a chair there of the Holocaust Remembrance Committee. And then I became a member, I was asked to join the Auschwitz Council, which was the responsible for changing the tone and the information that was mis, uh, mis, 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 misinformation that was displayed in Auschwitz-Birkenau as to the number of people that died and the fact that very few of those who, who were murdered there were Jews. So we had a huge job of, uh, changing it. And uh, I was there for 15 years, so we accomplished a lot. That's amazing. Um, so as we kind of near the end of the hour, I want to ask you one last question. Um, what do you hope people take from listening to your story? Well, wow, that's a very difficult question. They have to decide themselves of what they're going to take out of my question. I cannot give them, I only give them my information and it's up for the, to them to assimilate the information and that I gave them to it. You know, in the, uh, two years, three years ago, when I was asked, uh, when I was awarded the, the, the honorary doctorate and uh, I had to make a speech to the uh, students, the graduating class of the of um, teachers of some two thousand students graduating from the uh, faculty of uh, education, and my speech was that the second generation and the third generation, the generations that come with the, after us, are the bearers of the message that we are trying to convey, and the message that we are trying to convey is that hatred leads to Auschwitz. 
and that there's xenophobia leads to Auschwitz and uh, anti-Semitism uh, leads to propagating the hate which leads to Auschwitz. So we have, we have I'm giving you, you only the information from which I'm asking you to do the most that you can because it's your world. I'm almost, I'm at the end of my life, but you are there, you are, your life is ahead of you. And the way you are going to behave and the way you're going to teach your people and your children and you, your uh, co-patriots of what's, what the situation was during the Shoah and what the dangers are of the anti-Semitism and the xenophobia and the hatred of Israel today, it's in your hands. And I can't say it anymore, but you are responsible for what's going to happen in the next hundred years. Not me, not the survivors, we're gone. And now, now the ball is in your hands. So my message is take whatever you can from what we tell you and the information that we're trying to impart to you and run with it and change the world. Because if you don't change the world, it will happen again.